26-year-old Sinead Healy is missing in London. She was due to go for a meal with her friends, but she didn't turn up. That's not like Sinead. She would always let somebody know where she was, totally out of character. My mother got a cab with a friend of hers to Sinead's flat, and she got no answer. And then my mother phoned the police. Detective Chief Inspector Jim Dickey and his team are called in to investigate. I got a phone call from Hammersmith Police Station. They've got a very suspicious missing person. No friends or family had seen her. She hadn't been to work. There was no sense behind her disappearance. I arranged to go to the scene in Barons Court, which is ordering Hammersmith and Fulham. The police came and they broke in Sinead's door. There was no sign of Sinead. There was blood on one wall. It appeared to be a dressing gown and duvet missing from the property. Her bank card was still in the flat. A mobile phone was in the flat. It didn't look like she had planned to go anywhere. There was a wash in the washing machine. She had washing on the floor. That's not like Sinead. Sinead was very particular about things. Her flat was her pride and joy. It was just strange. Initially, we thought someone had gotten in and attacked her. That's, that's what we thought. We did investigations into Sinead's background. If you know lifestyle, it sometimes will lead you in the right direction. She was a lovely girl, full of life, vibrant. She liked to have fun. She'd go on holidays with her friends, you know, girly holidays. Life and soul of the party when she was anywhere. Just full of energy. Just, she's just a lovely child. A lovely child, yeah. We grew up in Feathered, County Tipperary. She was the youngest of four, and I'm the eldest. There was seven years in the age difference. And then we had two boys in between, and Sinead and I. Her family obviously loved her and adored her, and she was very close to our mum and dad. Eventually, we were taken to London by our mother. She had lots of plans, you know. Um, she'd done a lot of different jobs, so she had a lot of experience in different things. She was a, a very hard grafter. Despite there not being a body, Jim Dickey declares it a murder investigation. I believe Sinead hadn't disappeared of her own volition. Someone had assaulted her, and maybe she'd been wrapped in the duvet to remove her from the flat, either dead or alive. Her body disposed of somewhere, and that was the big question mark over the case. She didn't turn up in any hospital, so we've got to presume it's a homicide. I decided then we had to do a full forensic. You know, you must grasp the opportunities that are there very quickly, otherwise they'll disappear. Sinead's flat is now a crime scene. It is cordoned off so that the CSIs can search for any evidence to ascertain what has happened. Sarah Thurkle is one of the crime scene investigators who worked on the case golden hour, which is the first couple of hours of a major crime investigation, is one of the most important times. A lot of evidence could be lost during that first two to three hours. Of course, Sinead Healy might not have been murdered. It might just have been an attack, an assault at her flat. It might not even be Sinead Healy's blood. These are the things that we would need to ascertain to progress the inquiry. But the SIO was not happy when he viewed the scene and he felt that something wrong had happened. You would enter the flat fully PPE'd up with your scene suit on and you'd take photographs. You'd walk around and take notes. On this instance, there was a blood smear above the bed. Whose blood is it? And um, where has the source of blood come from? Since the crime scene, Sinead's flat, is left in a state of disarray, it indicates that the offender carried out this attack in a rushed and frantic manner. Little attention seems to have 
been paid to covering up or removing evidence from the scene. All the blood around Sinead Healy's flat would have been photographed in situ, then swabbed and sent off for DNA analysis to try and ascertain if it's all from one source, so Sinead Healy, or if there's been several different sources of DNA, and if so, who potentially that other blood might be from. If you've got a missing person that's not DNA you know, confirmed on the DNA database, we need to obtain a sample from their address so we know that it's their DNA. In this case, there was a hairbrush in the scene that had a lot of Sinead Healy's hair inside it. The roots of the hair provide a really good source of DNA. That sample's compared against any trace DNA that we find from the crime scene. Once the initial examination has been complete with the obvious forensic evidence, it's important to make sure that any trace evidence that you can't see with the naked eye is searched for. And as forensic scientists and crime scene investigators, we would go through that flat with a fine tooth comb. And if there's blood that's been cleaned up, we will find it. Within the flat, the bed covers had been removed. Was Sinead Healy wrapped up in the duvet and transported away from the scene? Or was there so much blood on there that the perpetrator had removed the sheets from the bed in order to destroy them? There were other flats in the building, so we spoke to every single occupant. And it turned out that late on the night that Sinead had gone missing or was last seen, neighbours had heard banging from her flat and indeed banging on the stairs outside leading down to the ground floor. Sinead's neighbours inform the police that something is missing. The communal waste bin that Sinead would have used, there was a number of them at the bottom of the stairs, uh, was missing. And I presume from that that it was used to transfer out the building. Dragging the victim's body into the bin would require substantial physical strength. It also requires an absence of a fear of being caught a distinct callousness and a subdued emotionality surrounding what happened. By removing the bin from the outside area, there appears to be a complete disregard for leaving clues behind as to what might have happened. Inside Sinead's flat, evidence of a violent altercation is emerging. Blood will show up really well under UV light low-level impact spatter was found on the skirting boards in the bedroom. As opposed to a blood smear, a blood spatter means more likely that it's a, it's a site of an attack. Either the spatters come from the weapon or from the victim, and low-level blood spatter would mean that the victim's potentially been attacked, either lying on the floor or fallen to the floor and then been attacked a second time. Jim Dickey updates the family and shares his growing suspicions. I told him, I hope Sinead walks through this door, but I've got to tell you, with my experience and my gut feeling and the evidence I have, albeit circumstantial, I fear the worst. Detective Chief Inspector Jim Dickey had decided that it was a murder case. And um, I remember saying to him, there's no way that anyone will have hurt her. I'm telling you here now, you know, it's incomprehensible. The CSIs continue to harvest the crime scene and make a discovery that provides a new lead. A fingerprint was found almost microscopic. It wouldn't have been visible to the naked eye and CCTV of Sinead's last movements reveals a prime suspect. <laughs> 26-year-old Sinead Healy has disappeared in London. Crime scene investigators are harvesting her flat for vital forensic clues. And despite there not being a body, the detectives believe they are hunting a killer. We found out through the family liaison officers and the family that Sinead was a fun-loving, vivacious young girl. She came from County Tipperary in Ireland, came over as a young child, worked as a cab controller for a local minicab office, and she lived in Barons Court, which is part of the borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. So for all intents and purposes, 
the workplace where she lived and her friends and family all lived very close in a very small area. Detectives draw up a timeline of Sinead's last known movements, enabling the digital forensic team to locate her on CCTV the evening before she went missing. We found out that she had been with a guy called Kenny Lynch in a pub called the Salisbury, which is in Fulham. She'd worked for him in his phone shop in Fulham Palace Road. Sinead was 16 at the time. She had just left school, so I took Sinead to her first interview there. She liked mobile phones. It was the up and coming thing. She knew all about them and she was learning as she went along. Um, and I think they developed a friendship um, over time. He did have a relationship with Sinead, but didn't have one anymore. That were still good friends. Kenny, we called him. If I popped up to Sinead's, sometimes he'd be there having a coffee or a tea, whatever. A really caring, kind guy. They used to go and meet for drinks and stuff like that. Yeah, if she needed anything, he'd help her and vice versa. What's important is get his version of events. Whilst the police try and track down Sinead's friend, Kenny Lynch, there has been a new discovery at the crime scene. A uh, partial fingerprint in blood was found on a door frame. So this is quite a bit of forensic evidence because you might be able to identify the person that's had blood on their hands and also you'd be able to identify whose blood it was. You would photograph it, swab the blood, trying to avoid the ridge detail on the fingerprint side of the fingerprint and then try and identify the ridge detail to a possible offender. No two people have identical fingerprints. You might have similar patterns on your fingers, you might all have whirls or loops, but the actual individual fingerprint pattern is different in every single individual. Not even identical twins have the same fingerprints. Every part of the fingerprint is composed of ridges and furrows. So ridges are the raised bits of your fingers and furrows are the indentations. And it's these individual differences that they compare and able to identify individuals' fingerprints against a crime scene map. The partial print is run through the National Criminal Database and the samples collected from Sinead's flat are sent to the lab for analysis. All blood swabs taken from a crime scene would be submitted to the National DNA Database for checking against all known offenders. If someone has offended before and is on the database, they will come up as a match against any blood found. Whilst the police await the results, they've managed to track down Kenny Lynch. The detectives from Hammersmith interviewed him in prison. Kenny Lynch was serving prison centres in Spring Hill Prison, which is in uh, Aylesbury. And indeed, he was convicted of handling stolen phones from that phone shop as a result of one of the police operations and searches there. Spring Hill is an open prison and it's used for the prisoners in the months leading up to release. So it's like a gradual reintegration into society. When you're allowed out on courses, especially selected and supervised in which you sign out yourself on say a Friday and you sign yourself back in Monday morning or, uh, on, or late on Sunday evening and you are trusted in that period to fulfill uh, your probation requirements. He was allowed to go home at weekends, he came back to London on a regular basis and he had a, a girlfriend that he had a relationship with. We didn't know that he was in an open prison. We didn't know that he had been out on weekend release. We didn't know any of that. That was all new information to us. Detectives interview Kenny Lynch at HMP Spring Hill. We said, you were the last person to see her alive. We know you had a relationship with her going back years. We know that she used to work for you. And we know you were in that pub, the Salisbury, the night she went missing, you know, account for your movements. And he gave an account. He was shocked that she'd gone missing. He said, you know, yes, I did have a relationship, you know, but that's in the past. She did work for me. I was with her that night. The CCTV, we showed it to him. He agreed that it was him. 
They got in a minicab and they went round to her flat. You know, that, that was proven. We, we had that evidence. And the minicab driver said they went to Baron's Court, where she lived, and they both went into the building, which is her flat. But I'd left because she took a phone call. That was a possibility. When they said they were interviewing, they did mention Kenny Lynch, and I said, no, he was a friend, he was her friend. Um, I know, you know, if he needed a fiver, and Sinead had it, she'd give it to him. You know, so there's no way he hurted her. Couldn't be possible. But he had no alibi, he had no witnesses, and no one had seen him at Sinead's flat. No one had seen him after he got in the minicab. Detectives questioned the prison officers who checked Lynch back in from his work release the weekend Sinead went missing. We found out that the prison discipline staff had noted on Kenny's return shortly after Sinead went missing, he had wounds on his hand which indicated that it could be defence wounds, i.e. that he'd been in some sort of fight with somebody. We're gathering intelligence, we're gathering evidence with the view, I thought, that we could put Kenny Lynch in the frame. It was clear to me that he wasn't telling the truth. The forensic results are back. The blood from the smear above the bed and the skirting board have raised a DNA profile, which is compared to the DNA samples from Sinead's hairbrush. Everyone's fears are confirmed. It is Sinead's blood. The fingerprint results are also in. They show a partial match to Kenny Lynch, and there are traces of Sinead's blood. But the detail of the print is so limited, it is inconclusive as evidence. So we couldn't say, for the purposes of a criminal prosecution, that that was Kenny Lynch's fingerprint in the blood. It indicated that it may be him, but it wasn't sufficient to say it was him. He gave an explanation. He said, well, yeah, I've been in a flat, you know, but so what? And he was quite blasé about it, really. His fingerprint could have been in her blood for a long time, and it was very difficult for the police to prove otherwise without concrete evidence as to what's happened to Sinead Healy. I said, you know, there's no way he hurted her. No, he was a friend. It had to be someone who didn't know her. And I remember Jim Dickey saying to us, 95% of murders are by somebody who is very well known to the person. It's not by a stranger. And I couldn't get over that. But look at all this forensic evidence. Look at this DNA. Look at the blood splattering, fingerprint in blood. All of this and Lynch, his proximity to all of it. And the last person being with her on CCTV. And that made him, for me, a very good suspect. But to prove murder, you need to have a cause of death, and that helps if you have a body. We didn't have that. It indicates to us that we're looking at the right person. Kenny Lynch has bailed and continues to serve his sentence at HMP Springhill. We can't just arrest him and interview him for as long as we want. It's not open-ended. We've got a set number of hours that we have to adhere to by law. We released him back on bail because he was still a serving prisoner. We said, you know, you can't release him daily anymore. So he wasn't a danger to the general public. That, in a way, took a little bit of the pressure off us. But we still had the clock ticking. We needed to prove that the version of events that Kenny Lynch gave us were lies. I tasked a consultant to track the movements of the mobile phones involved in this, and that was Kenny Lynch and Sinead's mobile. It takes literally months for this type of work to be done. In 2000, a lot of the phones were analog phones, and it was very difficult to pinpoint the movements using cell site data. Nowadays, cell site analysis is so much more accurate. Now, you can actually see where somewhere is. You've got maps see you walking down the street. That's a digital footprint, and everyone's got it on their phone. Back then, it wasn't that advanced. Sinead's mobile, there was no big surprises. 
It was active. She was making phone calls up to the time she disappeared that night. Kenny Lynch's was active up until that night. The crime scene was in Hammersmith, really close to the Thames River. And back in 2000, with the analogue signal, it was really difficult for them to pinpoint where Lynch was at certain times because the, the signal was jumping from one side of the river to the next. But the river was completely confusing the mobile phone signal. It was actually giving him an alibi, saying he was south of the river. He then switched it off, and we found out that his girlfriend had tried to ring him, I think it was over 20 times that night, and she couldn't get hold of him. It's believed that Lynch was now in a serious relationship. Detectives hypothesize how the fact he was spending time with Sinead, his alleged ex-girlfriend, may have been consequential. The motive is believed to be that Sinead threatened to tell the other partner. Kenneth may have entered a fit of rage and violence may have ensued after this. May indicate that Kenneth wanted to retain an element of control over his life and go to extreme lengths to protect this control. Kenny Lynch's mobile came back on again the following day. That was important evidence, important circumstantial evidence. Why was your phone switched off? The police have exhausted all lines of inquiry and the investigation loses momentum. We're basically a waiting game. We're running out of stuff that we can do here. You cannot allow frustration to get the better of you. Main thing is you have to stay objective, you have to stay focused, you have to stay professional. The motivation of most detectives, certainly when I served, is to get justice for the family, to give them closure because no one else is going to do it for them. Everything indicated from the, from the flat that Sinead Healy had been murdered, but until we found a body, it's very difficult for the police to progress the investigation. I had a, if you like, subliminal thought in my head that, you know what, Kenny Lynch might walk away from this. Detectives believe that 26-year-old Sinead Healy has been murdered. The prime suspect is her former boyfriend, Kenny Lynch, who was on work release from prison during the time she went missing. Without a body, the police do not have enough evidence to charge Lynch with murder. Six months after Sinead was reported missing, police receive a 999 call. A phone call came in from Thames Valley Police to my instant room from Beaconsfield saying that we've recovered skeletal remains very close to the A40 in Beaconsfield. And coincidentally, the A40 is the direct route Lynch would have taken from Hammersmith in London to Aylesbury, Spring Hill Prison. Sarah Thurkle was one of the crime scene investigators on duty. I was working for Thames Valley Police at the time when his body was discovered. I was one of the first CSIs that got called to the scene to assess what we had. A scene cordon was set up. We then had to consider calling out a lot of specialists, getting tent into the scene, lighting to the scene, closing off the lay-by. We had to consider any trace evidence, any footprints or any tire marks in the lay-by, food wrappers, drink cartons, cigarette ends, etc put a common approach path in to view the body. Common approach path is where you clear an area that is unlikely to be the route that the offenders have taken to get into the main crime scene area. Where the body was situated in was 15 to 20 metres from the lay-by, so not very far in. Viewing the scene straight away, it was obvious that there'd been an attempt to disguise uh, the burial of a body. Whoever had dumped it hadn't dug a very deep uh, grave, if you like. It had been partially covered with debris, earth. The body was left in the open with little attempt to cover it. This is a callous, remorseless body disposal. This was a classic dump site for somebody that had been killed somewhere else, brought there in a vehicle probably, and then dumped in the lay-by. Work on the recovery begins. It is important the identity is confirmed as soon as possible. 
They had told us that there was the remains of a body found. And at the time, we thought, oh my God, is that Sinead? It was really important to excavate the body properly. It's treated with the utmost respect. At the end of the day, we've, we're recovering someone's loved one. It's a horrendous crime, and we must make sure that we recover the maximum forensic evidence from that scene. We spent three weeks there, carefully removing all the soil around the body, sieving old bits, not only to look for bones and teeth, but also to look for other evidence. We're already in a nightmare. We were just taken from day to day. When we were excavating, we actually found quite a big clump of hair. Hair can survive a long time. It just doesn't degrade very much. And within that clump of hair was a green hair clip. This was crucial to the investigation. We took anti-mortem samples from a hairbrush in a flat. It confirmed the worst suspicions. We've got 100% match that the DNA is Sinead. The worst fears had now come to pass. We were horrified, you know, it was like a living nightmare. It's the only way I can describe it. Yeah. Anthropologists continue to extract the remains from the shallow grave and soon realize that the skull is missing. It is imperative to locate the skull as it could identify the cause of death. Because the body had been there for a number of months, sadly, some of the body had been taken away by animals. Her body had been eaten by wildlife. So what was left wasn't much. I can't even tell you what there was. Sorry. We had a wildlife expert looking at badger and fox trails. Foxes and badgers were quite habitual in their routes that they take, so getting an animal expert to the scene, we were able to try and ascertain where potentially the missing body parts might have been taken to. We were able to actually recover some of the bones from neighbouring fields from across the other side of the A40 few hundred metres from where the actual deceased was found. Finally, a breakthrough. Finding the skull was absolutely crucial to the investigation because without the skull, we probably wouldn't have been able to ascertain the cause of death. The body and the remains were taken to a post-mortem where a full post-mortem was conducted. We were able to piece the skull back together at the post-mortem and be able to identify that Sinead Healy had the fracture on the side of her skull where it looked like she'd been hit with a blunt instrument three or four times, which was probably the cause of death. This corresponds with the blood spatter evidence recovered from Sinead's flat. A full picture of Sinead's terrifying final moments is emerging. The violence itself was brutal and severe. Acts of this nature are rare, and many of us simply wouldn't be able to cause such harm in this way. And this indicates a real distinct callousness. Now we had the cause of death, now we had a body. We could prove that Sinead had been unlawfully killed. We still had to prove the link to Kenny Lynch. Yes, it was on the A40, a hurriedly disposed of body. Yes, it was Sinead Healy, yes, Lynch was down the road in Spring Hill Prison, but it was crucial to us that we could prove as best we could that Sinead had been dumped there, probably on the night or very close to it, that she went missing. It is vital that police prove Sinead was killed and her body dumped during the time that Lynch was on his work release from prison. This was going to be a waiting game. Scientists had to go all over the scene. So much was taken away for analysis, not just the body for a post-mortem, but all the surrounding area for the study of uh, insect growth, all to try and piece together when did this body first arrive at this scene and was put in the ground. 
I said I'd want an entomologist to the scene because what an entomologist is, is an insect expert. They can look at all this and can actually date it. It is quite phenomenal how accurate they can be. Entomology is the study of insects and it can be particularly useful in solving crimes, especially in estimating the post-mortem interval, which is also known as the time of death. This is because shortly after death, insects will colonise a dead body and within a few hours they can start laying their eggs. This can help determine the time since death because of the different stages of decomposition and also the different stages of colonisation of maggots and flies within the body cavities. Blowfly samples are taken from the remains and surrounding areas. Scientists use the morphology of the specimens to identify the colonising species and determine the life stage. The growth rate can establish the window of time when the body was deposited. What you can see here are blowfly eggs. They're approximately two millimetres in length. Single female blowfly can lay up to 250 eggs at any one time. Once the blowflies lay their eggs, they will hatch into the larvae. It would take approximately eight to 16 hours for it to develop into the second stage larvae. This stage is roughly about nine millimetres in length and at this stage they start to feed on the soft tissue. It can take a few more hours for the second insta to develop into the third stage. It's grown quite a lot in size. It can be up to about 20 millimetres in length. You can see the hook at the front here. It uses this to shred the soft tissue so it can consume it easily. Halfway through this stage, it starts to migrate away from the body and it will look for a site inside the soil to burrow and pupate. The outer shell will harden to form this dark brown. This can take several days for it to reach and pupate. So the adult will literally metamorphosize inside and emerge from there. The main species that were identified are species of blowflies, which are Califora vomitoria. Califora vomitoria is a species that is more active during the winter months. This can indicate that the deposition of the body may have occurred during the winter months and the colonisation would have occurred during the winter months as well. Sinead disappeared in the October of 2000. If Lynch did dump her body, it is likely to have been at the time he was returning to prison. The entomological data in this case suggested that the colonisation by the flies occurred within a month of the victim going missing. The time frame matches. Met police were, were overjoyed. This was a, a breakthrough they now needed in order to go and get Kenneth Lynch. The body had been discovered virtually on the road from Sinead's flat to his prison, or what could well have been the Sunday night before he signed back in. All our hunches, what we suspected, were starting to pan out now. It was the push we needed to get over the finishing line. We could prove that Kenny Lynch drove that route, that Sinead hadn't gone there of her own free will, that she'd been dumped there, been dead, and for me, we then had sufficient evidence to go to the Crown Prosecution Service and demand that they charge Kenny Lynch with murder. During the period when the body had not been found, it appears that Kenneth was really in control of the situation. He held the power and he wasn't deterred by the pain and the suffering caused to others around him that did not know what happened to Sinead again points to potential sociopathic tendencies. I was there when he was charged. He's facing the picture. I don't think he thought we were going to get it, and we did. As the trial approaches, Sinead's family are finally able to lay her to rest. Homicide detectives go to the funeral of every victim, if the family want us to. And I volunteered to the family, along with the family liaison officer, I said, look, we'll travel to Ireland for the funeral because they wanted her buried in the village where the family's from. It was a traditional Irish village funeral. Everybody came from everywhere and the streets were just full of people. 
to show their respect for Sinead coming home. We walked from the church to the cemetery where Sinead was buried. It was actually quite moving. You're a human being and you can't help but become uh, emotionally invested. You know, you're laying a young girl who shouldn't have died at the age she did in a grave and watching the village and the family mourn. In a way, the fact that Sinead was home now and buried, she wasn't lying out somewhere in the cold, suffering, you know, that meant something to us to have her back. <sighs> and I remember to this day standing next to the priest and I said to him, Father, thank you, you've done your job and I'm going to do mine. After months of intensive investigation, Kenny Lynch is to stand trial at the Old Bailey, where he finally comes face to face with Sinead's family. He had no respect. He almost had a grin that made him very hard to look at. Here's a man who thinks he's going to get away with it. In the spring of 2002, the trial of Kenny Lynch for the murder of Sinead Healy opens at London's Old Bailey. The Old Bailey is the most famous courthouse in the world. It has the biggest cases in Britain, and it is the fulcrum of justice. There's an aura about the building, there's an aura about a case there, and when it comes to murder, the Old Bailey is the place where these cases have to be heard. It's not over until you go through that agonising procedure, and he has to prove nothing. We had to prove beyond reasonable doubt. The prosecution believed that Lynch murdered Sinead whilst on a work release scheme from Spring Hill Prison and dumped her body on his journey back there. I certainly think that Lynch was an impetuous and dangerous man. He had a conviction for firing a gun in the street and he had an arrogant exterior. It was alleged that Lynch had once dated Sinead and that he killed her in a fit of rage when she questioned him about his other relationship. The family turned up many relatives from Ireland and there was quite a, a, a buzz about court as Lynch was brought in from the cells and up into the dock for the first time. It's always a brutal moment to see the killer of uh, nearest and dearest for the first time. And I could sense that the family and their friends were taking this hard. He had no thought for my parents. Leave me aside, my parents whatsoever. No respect. He almost had a grin that made him very hard to look at. But we did, because somebody had to, and Sinead wasn't there. There was a sense of arrogance about him. I thought that he, here's a man who thinks he's gonna get away with it. His trial lasted for six weeks. Each time we went a little bit more, things were uncovered and bit by bit, pieces, it became clear. The important witnesses, as far as the Crown's case was concerned, was the neighbours who heard the thumping. They knew what they heard. There was no mistaking it. He murdered her in her flat. He took her body and put it in her dustbin and took her and dumped her on the side of the road like a you wouldn't do it to an animal, never mind a human being. The scientists were able to pinpoint that window, narrowed it from the six months between Sinead going missing and the body being found, down to that narrow window, which was crucial to pin it on Lynch at the time he was away from prison. And finally, the cellmate was able to provide the motive. He told the police that when Lynch returned from his trip away, he told his cellmate that his friend Sinead, she was going off on one and they'd had a row. And here, for the police, was what they always suspected, that this was the motive for murder. Lynch wanted to shut up Sinead in order to keep his other relationship intact. This man was prepared to go to any lengths to ensure that he lived the life that he wanted to lead, and no one would get in his way at any time. Another indication of sociopathy is that we know that Kenneth was boasting 
to his prison inmates about his behavior. The ability to have such a calm composure after committing such a brutal act is quite unique to offenders. This may indicate an atypical functioning of the brain in relation to the emotion processing centers. By the time it came to Lynch to give evidence, uh, he came out with his excuses and his air of arrogance wasn't going down well with the jury. When it came to cross-examination, QC had him on toast. There's no other words to explain it. Forensic experts were able to put the killer at the crime scene. However many excuses Lynch was able to come up with of why he had been in that flat, he could not explain why he was there when Sinead was murdered. The forensics won the case. The forensic scientists and the evidence that they provided from the murder scene, which clinched the conviction and ensured that Kenneth Lynch, a murderer, found his just rewards, uh, his just deserts, and justice was done. When the verdict was returned, the verdict of guilty was greeted with muted cheers. There was a sense of dignity, but they could not contain the relief that their daughter had not died in vain, in so much that their uh, killer would be brought to justice. His look on his face was almost as if he had accepted that this was going to happen. But his haughtiness and superiority and self-regard was such that as he was led away to the cells, he turned to the family for probably the first time in the trial and smiled. And it wasn't a smile of any sort of hint of remorse or sympathy for their loss. It was a smile of, I'm better than you and I killed your daughter. And it was a smile that in all my years at the Old Bailey, it was a smile I'll never forget. The way that Kenneth behaved throughout the trial indicated that he didn't show any remorse at all for this crime. This isn't uncommon in very serious violent offenders and can be linked to difficulties processing emotion in their lives. When the guilty verdict was read out, I was very pleased for all my team because they'd worked hard. Some officers, you know, went the extra mile, but mainly very happy for the family that they got justice and they got closure. It has a, a lasting impact. It's, it, it never leaves you, never leaves you. The day he killed Sinead, he ripped out our souls. So my mother was never the same. But we thought that life meant life. <laughs> Big mistake. In 2016, Kenneth Lynch was granted parole and was released from prison. He's out and he's free, and he has a chance of a life now. The only people it meant life for was Sinead, who's gone, and us, who would have to live with that loss. The tragic, unnecessary loss of Sinead. What a waste. What a terrible, terrible waste.